Recently, I found an interesting book published 1953 in a second-hand shop. It's called The Seventh Continent, Saga of Australasian Exploration in Antarctica, 1895-1950. to That is, ten years before the Antarctic Treaty was put in place, which put a halt to unauthorized exploration as documented under Article 7 of the Act, if you're able to read between the lines. Each observer designated in accordance with the provisions of paragraph 1 of this article shall have complete freedom of access at any time to any or all areas of Antarctica. Article 1 of the Act states, Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only. There shall be prohibited into Elia any measures of a military nature, such as the establishment of military bases and fortifications, the carrying out of military maneuvers, as well as the testing of any types of weapons. The present treaty shall not prevent the use of military personnel or equipment for scientific research or for any other peaceful purpose. So under that clause, if an unauthorized explorer comes along, you know, someone who wasn't designated in accordance with the provisions of paragraph 1 of the 7th article, would it be fair to see this unauthorized person as a trespasser and therefore acquire the military personnel under the peaceful purpose to evict or prosecute this unwelcome explorer? Well, you might think it's a bit dramatic, which it is, but have a listen to what I'm about to read from. The Antarctic Treaty, Hearings from the Committee on Foreign Relations, 1960, under the heading Soviet Occupancy of the Antarctic as Constituting Trespass. Senator Green says that the Soviet be advised that her occupancy of the Antarctic constitutes a trespass and an unlawful intrusion upon the rights of those nations who established the basis for claims prior to this year. Mr. Pillen responds, well, the Soviet entered upon the area presumably when she had no rights under the international law to remain there. She was invited on a temporary basis to make scientific investigation in accordance with the agreement for the International Geophysical Year. That has ended. She continues to remain there. Now, I don't believe she has any right to remain there as an occupant, as a permanent occupant. I think all indications point to the fact that she considers herself to be a permanent tenant at the Antarctic. And he goes on to say, I think she is there as a trespasser at the present time. And a few pages down, Mr. Pillen now converses with a different senator. Senator Losh says, Now then, in your discussion of the articles of the treaty, you say, Article 1 attempts to limit the use of Antarctic for peaceful purposes and prohibits the establishment of military bases. The Soviet makes no distinction between civilian and military functions. All its activities are under one command. All activities support military objectives. You labor under the theory that, in the interpretation of this treaty, the Soviets will use those semantics that serve its purposes even though our understanding of the words used may be completely contrary to what the Soviet claims them to me. Mr. Pillion replies, The senator is 100% correct, and as the senator knows, the word peace is used altogether differently by the Soviets than we use it. The senator responds, I am not saying that this is a fact, but let's assume that the Soviets eventually should say that the search for peace and the establishment of it is only attainable through the expansion of the communist system of government, and that whatever spreads communism is the interest of peace, whatever thwarts communism is the promotion of war. And Mr. Pillen responds, that is the old story, Senator, that if you are shot by a communist bullet, it is a peaceful bullet and you are sent to a peaceful repose. So the treaty is open to interpretation on what may count for peaceful purposes, and the point of the video isn't to fearmonger. Frankly, Antarctica is massive, and I think the merciless seas and Antarctic temperatures are much more threatening than a few humans stationed on the landmass. So in the book I came across, I read this. Soon, they could see the smoky crest of Arabus 120 miles away. The day was so clear they could see Coleman Islands to the north, giving them a range of vision of 240 miles, showing how clear the Antarctic can be when the cool, dry air blows off the frigid interior. 240 miles is a long way, so I looked into the topic, browsed the web, and found a few more resources regarding this extraordinary visibility, then mapped some of the sightings onto Google Earth. So if Mount Arabus is 120 miles or 190 kilometers away from the Discovery boat, which is said to have had a crow's nest about 100 feet or 30 meters high, so we can assume the observer height to be about 100 feet. 
Mount Erebus itself is 2.2 miles or 3.7 kilometers altitude, and the expected drop from the boat's vantage point would only obscure about 60% of the mountain so it would still be viewable. However, if we look north to Coleman Islands, that's 155 miles or 250 kilometers away, which gives it a total drop of 2.5 miles, 4.1 kilometers. The altitude of the island itself is about 1.2 miles, 2 kilometers. So if you stack the island on top of itself, you still wouldn't see it. The curvature drop exceeds the height of a double-decker Coleman Island. If this sighting did take place, that is very interesting. However, I'll admit there's little information on it. The position of the boat is an estimation according to the 120 mile distance given in the previous sentence. And in other articles referring to this 240 mile range of sight, I haven't seen any mentions of Mount Arabis being 120 miles away. William Bruce, who referenced Armitage's comment about the visibility range, went on to say, In Spitsbergen, at sea level, I have seen the mountains on the south side of Bell Sound from the north end of Prince Charles Foreland quite clearly, a distance of 100 miles. If we map that out, although his description is very vague in saying mountains on the south side, 100 miles or 160 kilometers looks like this, and we can assume if he was at sea level and observe a height of 10 feet or 3 meters. That would expect a drop of 1 mile or 1.6 kilometers, which is greater than the tallest mountain in that line of sight being Horn Suntend, so if he did sight mountains 100 miles away, they would have been under the horizon. But because there's not enough data who can confirm this. The quote goes on to say, the only comparison in temperate climates is from mountaintops. From the summit of Ben Nevis, I have seen at one time the Black Isle and the waters of the Moray Firth, the Pentland Hills or Arthur's Seat, Barrowhead, 100 miles distant, and the coast of Ireland, 120 miles distant. If we investigate this account, Ben Nevis is 0.8 miles, 1.3 kilometers high, making that the observer height. The northern coast of Ireland being 120 miles, 190 kilometers away, should expect a drop of 2.5 miles, 4 kilometers. Ireland's tallest mountain, Carintu Hill, is only 0.6 miles or 1 kilometer altitude, so you could stack four of them on top of each other and still have it obscured by earth curve. Not to mention the fact that Carintu Hill is located in the south of Ireland. In The Picture of Scotland, a publishing in 1837, it was written, It is believed that the visible horizon from the summit of Ben Nevis is not much less than 120 miles, 190 kilometers, distant in all directions. The writer mustn't have been good at approximations, for that believed distance exceeds the geometric horizon of 80 miles, 129 kilometers, by 37 miles, or 60 kilometers. Now, aside from William S. Bruce's visibility accounts, I also came across extracts from the log of the Antarctic, which occasionally had comments on land sighted with recorded coordinates. We have a sighting of Victoria land from 18.5 miles or 30 kilometers distance, which is far from impressive. A sighting of Balany Island from 90 kilometers, but at the crow's nest height of 100 feet or 30 meters, 75% of the island should still be visible. The most interesting sighting is the one said to have seen Tasmania from 158 miles or 255 kilometers away, as there should be 2.6 miles or 4.3 kilometers of curvature, and the highest point in Tasmania is Mount Ossa, 1 mile or 1.6 kilometers, but that mountain is much further north of the land they were presumably seeing at the time.